Welcome to the High Note Podcast. On this episode, Josh Shaw, the Executive Director, Artistic Director, and Founder of the Pacific Opera Project, POP, was kind enough to spend some time with us going over his directorial philosophies and practices that have allowed him to take POP from not existing at all to being one of the most widely recognized opera companies in the country. And if you're the type of actor, singer, or singing actor who wants to get hired again and again and again, the first step is to truly become an athlete. And the best way to get started with that is to take the mind-body connection assessment that you can find in the description down below. I look forward to seeing your results. Welcome to the High Note Podcast. I am Ted Zanicki, owner and founder of High Note Performance and HNPacademy.com, where we take the tools perfected by sports science and bring them to the stage for singers, actors, and dancers so that they can become the type of athletes that companies want to hire again and again and again. I am thrilled to announce that we are uh, coming to you with a podcast from the one and only Josh Shaw, the director of Pacific Opera Project. Josh, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Oh, man. Glad to be here. Thanks so much. So for anyone who, who might not know, and I hope this number is very small, uh, Josh, what do you do? Uh, so I'm the founding artistic director and CEO of Pacific Opera Project, which is an opera company in Los Angeles. Uh, that is our mission for accessible, affordable, and entertaining opera. We've been around since 2011 uh, and have uh, done close to 60 productions at this point. And uh, in addition to that, I'm a freelance director and direct all over the country. Um, and kind of my, uh, kind of become the guy who does like these crazy updates for operas usually <laughs> although i do i do a lot of traditional opera as well uh but that's kind of what i'm known for i i have uh noticed both of those things that i wanted to, to touch on the schedule that that pop keeps is is incredible like what four to six fully staged operas per year right yeah yeah that's right um and that uh you know everything about pop kind of just organically became uh you know it's just kind of uh, in the early days, we I felt like, well, one, I just was so excited to be doing opera. I wanted to do it all the time. And <laughs> two, uh, you know, I we would if we would go three months without a show. I would just feel this like uh, loss of audience or loss of momentum. So it just became, uh, you know, we should do things a little more regularly than than some other places do. And our costs were very low at the time. Overhead was very low. So it kind of made, I mean, when we were doing a, a production, we were making money. So um, it just kind of worked that way. As we get larger, it's a little more difficult to do as many shows, uh, but we're still doing still doing four to five, four to six a year. So uh, That's busy. Incredible. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. I mean, if, if a production is making money, then why not do 50 a year? That's the... wow. Making money is relative, but <laughs> true, true. <laughs> or at least keeping you in the, in the black, whatever that means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And so you started directing in 2011, right? Uh, and before that, you were a singer, correct? I was, yeah. Uh, I did professional singing for about seven years, I think, something yeah. like that, after grad school. So, so what was it that made you want to make the transition into more of the director role? Uh, you know, it it wasn't it, it really wasn't that it was um, that I was in a lot of productions uh, that I just wasn't happy with or hmm. or um, more. It was I I was in a lot of productions where I saw time waste for myself or my colleagues, more for my colleagues, and just you know, and I found myself doing more and more anyway to improve the productions, whether that was helping with the set or helping with marketing or bringing my own costumes or translating the whole libretto for, you know, the, so, so everyone would know what they were saying. Uh, and uh, I was singing with a couple people at the time and we just thought, you know, this is at this point, it might just be more fun and easier to, to kind of do it ourselves. And that was the beginning of uh, everything that's happened now. And I had no experience directing. I directed one, I didn't want to do a recital in my master's program, so I put together a production of The Tragedy of Carmen uh, in 2002 or something like that. Uh, and that was the only directing I'd ever done in my life. I had no business doing it, but um, just 
somebody needed to do it. So <laughs> it was me. <laughs> uh, so I was sort of getting the vibe that 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 is a lot of your a lot of your experience and a lot of your life story. It's like, well, someone needs to do this, and I guess I'll either I either have the skills or I'll figure it out. And suddenly, here you are at, at le leading Pop into this next season. A hundred percent that. And honestly, it's been the most exciting part of the whole career is like every learning something is generally very fun. And then doing it for the first four to 10 times is very fun. And then it gets a little less fun and becomes a little more work. I mean, I'm still happy, love what I'm doing, but you know, I mean, there's so many skills that go into running an opera company or, or, or just producing an opera uh, from, you know, uh, scenic design and building that I kind of came by I kind of I don't know I just kind of grew up knowing how to do that I don't, I don't know can't explain it really um, but then lighting like I just you know there was no budget for lighting and like uh, the equipment is in the early days was so janky and old like I just was embarrassed to try to hire a lighting designer you know so kind of learned lighting and now I still do it and now like we just got all this new equipment through a huge grant and like I have to learn how to use that. I just feel like I should know how to use the equipment, you know, that uh, even though it's top of the line and I could just get a lighting designer in here. But so that's a whole project I have to come up with. But then, you know, that's just one aspect. In the beginning, I was doing costumes, too, because, again, no money. And then, uh, you know, silly things like learning uh, Photoshop. That was, you know, you, you could have a whole master's degree in Photoshop, I think. And now AI. I'm trying to, like, catch keep up with that. Uh, and then there's all the boring stuff of contracts and, and bookkeeping and, and all that, which I don't enjoy at all, but had to learn somewhat uh, to keep us going until we got uh, more staff. So, uh, you know, that, like I say, it was all so fun, you know, and for many years, it was just like, the stakes were both very high and very low, you know, like, it was always like, oh, we got to make this one the best one we've ever done. We still feel that way. But like, in the first two years if we failed and no one came you know it was like well oh well <laughs> that was fun you know and who can you know no one's life livelihood depends on this and you know the artists still got to do something they were proud of and everybody got paid so um you know and again as we get bigger there's just there is this pressure now of like no we have to succeed like now we we are a known thing and uh yeah. if this institution went away not only would many artists lose opportunities and staff would lose jobs but you know the community as a whole would would lose something that's important to them yeah it, it seems like pop really has already made a made a huge mark in, in the la area and in, in opera all over the country i i hope so i think so uh i know we have very very devoted uh fans and patrons uh that that uh you know make it a huge priority to be at our shows which is difficult in la you know to make anything a priority where you have to drive <laughs> somewhere is, is yeah. difficult in la so um we have just the greatest fan base um that's one of the things i'm just so proud about it's one of the things that i can allows us to get singers from all over the country because they know they've heard when they come here you know, the crowd's going to be great. It's going to probably be a party the whole time. And, uh, you know, people care. People are going to come. They they, they want to be there. They're not just checking their subscription box um, that they've been doing for 20 years. So uh, that's that's one of our best aspects here. Yeah. And, and what do you think that you as as a leader and as, as uh, the, the head of this company have really done to, to foster that and make that happen? Uh, I think, uh, well, one technical or one boring thing is like I set out from the very beginning where we were not going to waste people's times or talents. So if you commit to this project, I commit to making a schedule that uses your time as wisely as we possibly can mm -hmm. and that I will be prepared for every rehearsal and so will whoever else is the, the conductor or whoever. Uh, so that we never, you know, waste your time or talents because we've all worked way too hard to get where we are as singers and artists um, to to not be respected that way. And then that's the artist side of it. And then the the patron side of it is I just want people to have a good time. Like 
whether that means I make them cry through a production or I make them laugh for two straight hours or just be at awe of some amazing singing. Um, you know, I want people to be entertained and have a good time. Um, and I'm really not interested in anything else. I'm not interested in proving any points or changing any minds on anything. Um, if that's the kind of company and director you're looking for, go somewhere else. Um, because it really, I view opera as entertainment. I just happen to land in this field of entertainment, um, which is very unique. And uh, so I think people really latch onto that. Who doesn't want to come and have a good time and be a little bit impressed, you know? Yeah, yeah. And the the works that I've seen pop put up or are I mean, entertaining is, is absolutely the best word for it. The the adaptations that you've made of so many different operas. Uh, I won't spoil any surprises. I'll, I'll let you do that. Uh, but what what are some of the ones that, that stand out in your mind? Oh, it's pretty. I mean, there's I think there's three that are like the biggies. Um, uh, one is La Boheme, a.k.a. The Hipsters. Um, yeah. So we're based in now we have a, a building in Highland Park, which dream come true. I can't believe uh, we have a long lease here um but our one of our main venues is right next door and it's a small we can cram 180 people in there at tiny cocktail tables um and uh in 2012 i saw this building driving by it had a four lease for rent sign on it it's like a, a old 1920 1913 supper club kind of vibe um and uh you know called and called and called finally got somebody on the line and we rented it and uh you know, we had this production of Bohem, which the story of that is a great story. It was, we were doing, this is only our second year of existence. And we were doing Sweeney Todd, huge production of Sweeney Todd. Yeah. We had no business doing Sweeney Todd in our second year. <laughs> but I mean, when you're small, you can do so many things. There were no microphones. Everyone was getting paid peanuts. You know, the rights were very low because our tickets were stupid cheap. So we were doing this great production of Sweeney Todd. And uh, me and some of my buddies in the show were sitting at a cafe over here. In Highland Park, if you don't know Highland Park, it's like hipster. It's been hipster central for 15 years. Now. It was hipster uh, before hipster was cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's crazy. And it just continues somehow that way. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, we were sitting at a cafe and we were like, what are you going to do after Sweeney Todd? And I was like, I have to get back to the restaurant. I was a waiter. I have to get back and pick up some shifts, some out of money. And one guy was like, I got to get my my studio going again, teaching lessons. And the other guy had to do this. And somebody was like, oh, it's just like Bohem, you know, where they all have these jobs to make ends meet. And somebody was like, well, why don't we just do Bohem instead? And so that was the beginning of the hipsters. And uh, that was the first time we introduced table seating with food and wine included. Back then, it was crazy cheap. I think it, I think two a table for two people with a platter of food and a bottle of wine was $65, I think, and a hundred dollars for four people. Um, and we had 23 tables in there and we thought this is amazing. A couple of years later, we were cramming uh, 43 tables in there plus extra seats, you know, and like just, it was a real party, but that production, uh, it's set in Highland Park. It's all in Italian, but the uh, super titles are very loosely translated. So if it says Paris, it says Highland Park. If it says Momus, it says the York or whatever the local thing is. And lots of inside jokes. And Act 3, they go up to Big Bear. And, um, you know, but the idea was these people on stage are the same people in the seats or the same people you just walked by getting here. So it was very uh, accessible, very relatable. Uh, and very heavy on laughs. Um, so that that was one of our trademark. That way, that's what gave us our um, mascot, Hipster Puccini, yeah. back there. Which is great, by the way. I love that image. <laughs> that was just can't even tell you where that came from. I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I saw the picture of him and thought eh, these. And back then, now everybody has pink, like as their as their color. You know, pink and yellow in particular. Back then, nobody did it except maybe like T-Mobile. Um, <laughs> So it's really stood. I, oh, that's what it was. I wanted a poster that would be up around Highland Park that people couldn't ignore. You know, like it's just so bright. They they can't ignore. Um, so that was the beginning of kind of this updated, uh, irreverent, people always would say, um, stuff. And then just uh, I have to say a little bit more about that. We've done that production. I don't know how many times, seven times maybe. 
and we've done it in bars now and all kinds of stuff. But um, what was so cool in the big heyday of that production, which I would say was 2018 and 2019, we had two casts going, like nine performances. And and you know, people were just packing the place. But it, what was so amazing is people were coming to La Boheme having no idea of what the story was. So and it's very heavy on like almost group participation and tons of laughs and tons of drinking, you know, encouraged. So, you know, people were getting wild and you hear bottles knocking over and all this stuff, which I just loved. And then, but these people would not know that La Boheme is a tragedy. So all of a sudden- they were laughing so much throughout the whole opera. Yeah, and all of a sudden they would get to act four and like Mimi would come in and it would just go from like cheering and, and laughing to just like sobbing. I mean, just, and that was like, that's what we're doing. That's, that's, uh, that's what I want to be doing, you know, making people feel things um, in an entertaining way. Uh, okay. So that was, that's one. And then um, the second big one, which really put us on the map nationally uh, was, is the abduction from the Seraglio as set as an episode of the original series of Star Trek. Yeah. Um, and that was actually started at a summer festival I do in um, Southern Illinois, Southern Illinois Music Festival. And they wanted to do abduction because they kind of had a cast already there. We also did Lucia that year. And they're like, what what can we do with Lucia? And it's like kind of abduction. But, I, you know, that shows we're not going to do it in German. And the English that's out there is terrible. So before I even thought, I was like, I'll just write a new one. No business doing that. Never <laughs> Whatever. I'll just rewrite a libretto. No sweat. Yeah. And so I got into it and I found that I really just like love doing it. Like it was, you know, that's one of those things you really, I love it. I love it. I love it. And then I hate it for a day and then I love it. I mean, you know, it's so reward. It's like a puzzle, you know, and I, I just really get off on the clever rhymes and the clever situation. So this is all multi no, I mean, there are considerable cuts, but no additional music, um, but all Mozart and then the storyline plot is very similar to to abduction. It's, you know, that's that's how that Star Trek came about. I started thinking about alien abduction and I thought uh, Star Wars because I was much more familiar with that. And then I stumbled on the Star Trek and like started watching all the old episodes and every episode is basically someone's kidnapped on a planet and we go down and get them back. Like that's yeah. almost every single episode. And uh, I was able, you know, we had Uhura and Captain Kirk and Spock. And then, like, uh, we brought in the Orion slave girl for Blondie. And the Klingons are the bad guys, which, you know, so many things in my career just happen to work out. Like, I have no interest in, uh, you know, making opera PC or or fixing, fixing the problems of uh, opera, which is funny because I end up speaking on that all the time now just because of some of the productions I've made, yeah. but it was just like, I just, again, I just want people to be entertained and have a good laugh. So, but the byproduct is like, I mean, you know, there's raised some, raised some problems in abduction, but <laughs> if they're all Klingons, it's like, you know, that kind of goes away. Right. Uh, <laughs> unless you racist against Klingons, I guess it's okay. Um, so that was a big hit and that ended up going on to other, um, companies around the country after here and then we did a huge production our first production at the ford amphitheater um which is right across from the hollywood bowl and 1200 seats and so that was a big oh actually we did it at the el portal first but it, then it went on to there that's a, so, a huge yeah. change from from you know wine and dinner while watching bohem that's a it is except except we still have the food and wine you know in the seats there so it is oh, okay. very it is this party atmosphere and man those fans you got mozart fans and star trek fans together and they just <laughs> go wild and everyone's showing up in costume and asking for autographs and and you know uh the inside jokes are just crush perfect uh so that's if anybody's listening it's been several years since we've done that i'd really like to do that again uh somewhere um and it sells great and small cast and all kinds of upside sure. um then the the third biggie is the uh, super flute um which is a you know kind of my follow-up again i was tasked with doing the magic flute and i hate the magic flute um <laughs> so I what do you like, hate about it boring 
Um, the symbol, nothing makes any sense to us, you know, anymore, all this Masonic stuff and, yeah, you know, and I just, it's always billed as a kid's opera and it really has other than Papageno, like there's no, nothing that makes this good for kids or particularly entertaining for kids. You know? It's a little better if you ended after Act One, but still, it's <laughs> yeah, 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 much better that way. But so I had to do this again for the Southern Illinois Music Festival, and so uh, me and Scott Levine, who went on to be the Papageno in that um, several times, um, were kicking around ideas and uh, came up with this video game idea. And I'm, you know, grew up in the early '90s uh, playing Nintendo and Super Nintendo, so that was something I knew well. You know, it's the same thing with with the Star Trek. It it doesn't matter if you don't care at all about sci science fiction. If you've lived in this country any time past the '60s, you've definitely seen the guy in the blue shirt with the pointy ears and Captain. You know what Captain Kirk's shtick is. So, you, we've got generations of people who can relate instantly. Say, "Oh, I know what that is," and you've got a huge group of people that say, "Oh my God, I love retro video games. I'm going to go see that opera. I don't care." I don't I hate opera, but I love Mario. So this gets a new audience in for us. And then we we are typically incredibly good at if someone comes to see us once they're going to come back again because they have a good time and it doesn't cost much money. Hmm. So Superflute is uh set in the worlds of Mario and Zelda, just those two um franchises. And uh, Papageno uh, is becomes a coin collector instead of a bird collector. And uh, Tamino is Link from Zelda, which works great because he's always on these quests. And, you know, particularly the the end of the opera with the, the trials. I mean, those are just levels of a video game, you know, beat this level to the next one. And then we got Donkey Kong is the Rostro Kong. And uh, <laughs> Mina, Mina is... Zelda and Papagena's Princess Peach, and then also one that works really well is uh, Wario and Mario as um, Manasatos and, and Mario. Um, so you know something, a, a lot of it's hard, hard work, and a lot of it's dumb luck. Like some of those things just lined up better than I could have ever imagined, and then you know more dumb luck. The second time we do uh, Magic Flute in North Hollywood. Mario World opens like a week before, right down the street. So uh, that's pretty perfect. Yeah, a lot of a lot of a lot of kismet, uh, along with a ton of work. That one was particularly hard to write um, because I wasn't as familiar. I had never been in Magic Flute, hmm. um, but uh, I'm very happy with that one. That that'll be going up again in um, Cincinnati at Queen City Opera in Cincinnati this summer. Oh, so that's awesome. Uh, again. That one sells like crazy. <laughs> like, you got a <laughs> magic flute. You might as well do one that more people want to see. Um, and it's cheap. And, you know, we're very careful about um, copyright with both of those things. You know, there's sure. a lot of inside jokes of we don't call it the Nintendo opera. We, we don't even say the word Mario. Like it's, it's all tongue in cheek because these are all, you know, and we've had lots of questions about that uh, legally. And it's, it's, pure par parody and um we nobody i mean who cares nobody cares about us we're not making that much money um <laughs> no i still i think that's super wise nintendo nintendo is famously litigious famously the so. nintendo ninjas they they call them i learned uh they have a whole division that does that um so those are the kind of the three three ones that i would say people know pop for the most but there's been a million others there's been the moving tosca which moved every act on the campus of a church there's um our old west mary witter uh which was a new english yeah. update set in, in goldless california um we just did a fighter mouse i wrote a new book for that sets it in 1929 hollywood um and film stars and all that kind of stuff um i all that all that's great and good and we do a lot of that but we also do just plain old good opera you know just regular you know just a regular what have we done regular <laughs> i mean we did a very traditional lucia but it was outdoors like on the side of a mountain basically so it wasn't exactly regular but uh i'm sure we've done some just standard we just did scalia ginsburg that was 
exactly as it's written. So yeah, I mean, and that that's that's such a tour de force of a piece. Oh, uh, I I directed that three times in the last two years, and I just I really think that's a great opera that everyone should, well everyone is doing it now, but like yeah. <laughs> three people relevant. Again, figures everyone has, knows and has seen, um, and just very clever writing. Yeah, yeah. So I, I know it's a little foggy on, on how you really like sunk your teeth into directing at the beginning. So you, you start off with like just doing it because you had to, and then uh -huh. suddenly companies from all over the country, but maybe all over the world, I, I'm blanking at the moment, uh, <laughs> just start hearing about you as they're reaching out for you to directorships. No, no, no. I mean, I definitely worked at it. Um, I, I would say I was always, always, but by the time I was done singing, I, I really enjoyed the dramatic side of it more than the singing side of it. Um, and I was a tech, so, um, so I don't know. I just don't tell anybody, but directing's not that hard. Um, <laughs> you do your research and have a couple ideas and know the key is to know the score better than it, the, the words, at least better than anyone in the room. If you know that you can do whatever you want as a director, cause you have a reason, if you can give a reason, it's fine. Uh, and then being organized is the greatest downfall of most directors. I think just artistic minds, not organized mind. I'm a highly organized mind. Um, so, you know, I mean, people saw the success of pop, uh, how audiences, you know, we never had, a, we're talking small audiences, but we never had a problem filling seats in the first. I mean, really until the pandemic at all ever i think we might have had two or three shows that didn't like meet sales projections in the whole time um i thought it was very calculated let's do what we know we can accomplish and not you know let's not try to sell a 3000 seat venue but that's not gonna happen um so people started to notice that and you know i put in a lot of work into contacting people and you know after a couple of years of this i was like well i guess this is how i need to make a living <laughs> for the rest of my life so started you know trying to find ways to actually get paid to do what i was doing um and uh that kind of grew and i think i just i generally bring um well thought out concepts that people the general public will find entertaining and interesting and I'm pretty easy to work with and have a good time and so that's just led to being rehired most places that I work and of course that leads to being hired at other places and I mean it's a grind it's a constant grind but um I've been very lucky to have really more more opportunities than I can even take at this, this point so yeah and with the the works that you've re rewritten isn't the right word but re revised I suppose it uh it seems like you've done a really noteworthy job of taking an audience that already exists and and serving them the opera that they want to see yeah i mean it goes both ways uh there are definitely letters that come in not here because people kind of know what to expect here but when i go and direct other things and for instance the star trek opera you know you will get the couple letters every time that say how dare you but mm. you'll get ten letters that say god i bet mozart would just freaking love this you know um so you know i I don't know what was the what was the question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just commenting on on how you're. It seems like you're really good at seeing a group, seeing an audience that will come oh, and see yeah. a show. Potentially, well, I, mean, I, I just want more people. That's the goal. That's the whole goal. It's just I want more people to come. Like that's a greedy goal and that's a lofty artistic goal. But it's just like I think we do something that's unbelievable. I mean, people come see shows. <laughs> I had a show a year ago and uh, Barbara Seville and one of the singers was incredibly sick. It's a miracle he even could make it through the show. And people who I know have been to a dozen operas um, came up to me later and they go, was his microphone not on? I'm like, there are no microphones. Like, <laughs> like you know, people just don't, we live in a world so removed from from live theater in general, but unamplified live theater or live music is just unheard of. So, yeah. you know, people, you know, will just be shocked when we're in, uh, we are opera in general is in a 2000 seat venue with no microphones. And uh, that's superhuman, you know, and then take all that training and all that uh, athleticism. And then, you know, these people are also super funny. And, or super moving uh, or super attractive or whatever, you know, like um, fingers crossed for all of those. Why not? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's even better. Yeah. Uh, so it's just, I just want, I want to find a way to trick people into coming. That's what I say. You like <laughs> trick people into coming, trick people into coming to the opera and you might find out that you actually love it. I think that's that's a valuable tool for for all of the aspiring directors and and you know opera marketers for lack of a better term out there is it? Yep, yep. And gimmicks. So, I mean, I love a gimmick. I mean, yeah. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with. It. I don't know why people treat that like a bad bad word. Sometimes it's like give me every gimmick I can find. You know, speaking of gimmicks, how how much of of your success and pop success do you think can can really be attributed to your suits? 
zero. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah, gimmick. I mean, that's that's another organic gimmick. I didn't, I don't, I never wore those kind of clothes. I don't wear those kind of clothes except at the show. Like, um, sure. Uh, so for your people that don't know, like I uh, somewhere along, I I know when it was. It was twenty thirteen, Carmen. Um, this all started where. Um, I, I, I generally, especially if it's a premiere production or a new production or a big production, I get a new suit for the show and they're often very tacky or very flashy. Um, and, but that started with Carmen. Uh, I just got this cool red kind of shiny suit, um, and people liked it. So then I don't remember what was next. Well, La Calista was next, but I don't know what I wore for that. Anyway, it just started where, like, you know, if I was wearing this kind of bright or crazy suit, like, it was always a conversation starter with anyone in, in the audience. And I, you know, we're very social here, and there's a lot of me just walking around, shaking hands and talking to people. And and uh, and I think it was just the, you know, if I wear this suit, some crazy suit, it's going to be an easy start of a conversation with, with anybody because they'll say, whoa. Or the most common thing is, whoa, this suit's kind of calm for you, <laughs> you know, no matter what it is. Because now you um, have a reputation. Yeah, yeah. And I can't possibly live up to it. Uh, also, like the the progression of suits just in the uh, 13 years, 12 years we've been doing this is insane. I used to go downtown L.A., buy those suits, you know, in person. And there were they were just like a bright red suit or a shiny silver suit or something. Now you can get a suit with any pattern in the world in a, a day uh, over Amazon. And that's what sure. I do now. Like, you know, I have, I had the, I think the most famous ones are probably the, the blood splatter suit for Lucia. Um, the super Mario Pac-Man suit is one of my favorites. Um, at this time I have a super Mario suit. That's just all Mario characters all over it. Um, but, you know, I also occasionally try to get a suit that's kind of flashy, but I can actually wear again. Uh, so <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of slightly tasteless suits that still still work. I, you know, I have a red suit, a yellow suit, a green suit, a purple suit, all of these things. So uh, but yeah, nothing to do with I don't think they do anything except eat up my uh, budget, <laughs> my personal <laughs> budget and my closet space. Well, it does make for a fantastic photo gallery on your website, which will be linked somewhere nearby if anyone wants to check that out. Uh, <laughs> so uh, let's talk about a little bit, uh, excuse me, let's talk a little bit about what's coming up next for Pop. Great. Uh, so uh, we finished this season with our with a huge production, which I should have included in the signature productions. Uh, it is, I so, think it's the most. Actually, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Let's actually talk about that first because I think that's that's a little more pressing. Um, the yeah. the uh, butterfly that you're doing. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh, that's the first two weekends of June. Uh, this is a production I in, came up with. I mean, a decade at least before I even started directing. I was singing Pinkerton for the second time in a butterfly production, and suddenly, I mean, shame on me, second time doing it. I was like, wait a second, how am I talking to Butterfly right now? Like, <laughs> I don't speak Japanese. She doesn't speak English. We definitely don't speak Italian. Um, and at that point, I was just like, man, somebody should do a, a, a Butterfly one day where they speak in their own languages. Um, and this was so, I was so far from any kind of directing. Uh, but then... Mm -hmm. Then that came, would come back around once I started writing these other librettos and that was always in the back of my head. And I was always like, yeah, but I mean, how? Like, that would require so much work. First of all, I'll have to find a Japanese collaborator. Then, you know, like, how am I going to find people who can, like, maybe I could find enough Asian singers, but God, learning Japanese. And then, you know, pop was growing and growing. And we live in this one of the few places in this country where there are all kinds of people um, who sing. Um, and then I met uh, Aki Isamura, or, or sought him out maybe, um, at Up in the Heights. Uh, he's the music director and executive director there. And we got talking about the project and he was like, let's do it. Uh, they were a little larger in scale than us at the time. This was 20, I mean, it ended up being in 2019 when we did it the first time. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, 
surpassed every dream I had for it. Like I, you know, as I said, I thought, oh, well, we'll get a couple of Japanese, maybe we can get a Japanese butterfly and then we'll have to get other Asian singers for all the others. That first production, with one exception, was um, completely Japanese singers for all the Japanese roles, including a chorus of like 30 people. Wow. And we had, uh, it was at the Japanese American Community Center, the Aratani Theater. It's a beautiful 800 seat theater in Little Tokyo. Um, super titles in both languages. We also had quite a bit of staff that ended up being Japanese or Japanese American just mm. because they wanted to be involved. And then we had this incredible kimono. Uh, not costumers like kimono company um so every all the costuming was 100 percent authentic on the on the japanese side um and uh it was just like you know i mean i would leave those perform oh we also sold 800 seats a night which was you know Phenomenal. crazy for us it would still i mean we hope to do it again but uh you know and it was just like this is it this is i mean and i i probably stand by that i can't imagine i'm ever going to do think up something that that's more special more effective more you know it's just it, 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 i don't know what to say you can watch it on youtube um or better yet come <laughs> come in june it's worth <laughs> it's worth traveling for our, wherever you're at to come see it uh, also the opera america conference is in town that week that's why we decided to do it uh, during that time. So the World Opera Conference is the week before that. And then the Opera America Conference is the first week of June. So we hope a lot of people who are coming to that will come check it out. Um, and again, it's going to be at the Artani Theater and uh, mostly Japanese cast and uh, the whole whole ball of wax. So excited about that. Yeah. And so um, you, this is the second time that that you're mounting this production. Second time, well, the first time it was a co-production with Opera in the Heights in Houston, so we did it here. Then all the principals and the costumers went to, and me, went to, and the set, <laughs> went to uh, Houston. And okay. then uh, from day one, we were like, we have to do this again, like next year, but then 2020. Uh, yeah. So we're finally in a place where we can get back to it. It's still going to be, it was our largest production that time, and now coming back, it's going to be our largest, most expensive production ever this time as well so um you just keep big. raising the bar yeah <laughs> <laughs> a lot of tickets to sell come 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 see it yeah absolutely <laughs> well, and, and i i know that accessibility is one of your core values and if i remember right your tickets are always 15 dollars. is that correct we always have almost always almost. have tickets start at 15 dollars. so it start at 15 okay yeah so as things have you know inflation and everything and we have a building and everything we we still keep that um that access point but of course you know other tickets go up i think typically we're getting up for a, a big production like that they'll go up to a hundred dollars or something in the the best very best seats true and and everything is available for live stream as well or almost everything yeah for free so for we'll free. be live streaming that. Uh, anything that doesn't have rights, you know, uh, royalties, associate new new music, uh, yeah. is we record professionally uh, and live stream it, and then it remains on YouTube for forever. So you can watch forever like never on That's great. Forty pop productions on YouTube anytime you want. That's such a valuable resource, and I I, I wish more people knew about it. Uh, I yeah, please spread the word. Uh, we we have a that's. I mean, we do pay people to do it, but that is mostly led by one board member who decided that was like his mission in life to like learn how to do all that and make it happen. And, you know, he bought all the equipment <laughs> also. Oh. Yes. You know, so we're talking, I don't even want to know how, how much money, <laughs> but even more time Rob Webb has put into that. And it's just, it's so crazy. It's just like, it's like a whole TV production, you know, they got monitors everywhere. They got five cameras out there, sound headsets. Uh, and you know, often it's like, guys, you've got like four hours the day before you can set up and then we got to do it the next day. Cause we're outdoors or we're, mm, you know, who knows where. Um, but it's just, I, in particular, this last Flater mouse, um, stream, I thought was just top of the line professional. Stuff. It it really shows it when like in going through and watching some of those recordings, they're really high quality stuff. 
It's also just like great for our artists because so many places you go and sing or even where I direct, you know, you're locked into contract union contracts where you can't use any clips uh, and all that stuff. So that's another great thing for people who sing for us. They know they're going to get a high quality recording of what they do. Fantastic. Fantastic. And so we, we jumped the gun a little bit. So I want to give that give uh, your next season uh, a bit of a spotlight as well. Great. So you're the first person I'm talking to about this. So we'll see. <laughs> we are recording before it's technically announced, but I'll promise I'll keep my mouth shut. This won't go out, go out uh, until after. We'll see if I can remember release. it all. I mean, it is literally <laughs> falling into place. Like I was at a venue this morning. I was doing a contract this, this afternoon for a venue. Um, so I'm really excited about next year. You know, uh, pop is so much about experience beyond just a performance. So that's another reason we have such a, a a great crowd base uh because we always take them new places um and not and we do site specific but i would just say more we find the coolest places where we can make opera happen and go there um so uh, we're going to start the season at uh, a great venue descanso gardens which is like the big one of the two big gardens in la uh, we did Into the Woods there two summers ago, and we did Hansel and Gretel there last year. This year we're coming with um, Rizalka, which, um, as far as I can tell, is an L.A. premiere of Rizalka. I cannot find any evidence of it ever being done here, which seems a little crazy. It does, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, that, you know, a big production. We're doing six performances, 500 seats a night outdoors, um, you know, mics and everything for for all of it um and that will be in july the the second and third weeks of july after the fourth of july weekend um and six performances <clears throat> and then we take a little break and then we'll be back in uh the first two weeks of november at a brand new venue which is like the hottest place in our neighborhood now it's called the garibaldini club garibaldina club and it's the oldest Italian American society in the U.S. And this, this is, um, it's just had this revitalization in our neighborhood. Like it's the cool place to go. I mean, like you can't get a ticket to their pasta dinner. And I was just there today. I was like, well, I'll, I'm ready to join. And they're like, well, you're gonna, you're gonna have to wait a year now. The list is too long. Um, and it's just so retro. It is like it was built in 1965. It looks like it hasn't been touched since 1965. Bro. So we're doing a very obscure opera called Don Bucefalo, which is by Canoni, which who was a student of Donizetti. Hmm. So it sounds just like Donizetti with some Verdi and <laughs> Rossini also stolen. Um, and it's a meta opera about a uh, composer who wanders into an Italian village and it's like, I, I'm going to make you famous. You'd be my chorus. You'd be my soprano. You'd be. And uh, so we're setting it as in in the garibaldina in 1968 or wherever so and it's we'll have pasta table seating with you know pasta and wine and uh very very cheesy very kitschy retro which we just love you know we a big part of our brand is we always ask people to come in costume to the performances and get mm. a lot of great turnout for that um so that's going to be in november and that's our first time at the venue and it's a mile you know it's a mile from our home base here which is amazing um and that opera hasn't been done in the u.s since 18 something it was done once at the brooklyn academy of music um so almost a u.s premiere of that one that'll be in italian uh Rizalco, we're going to do an english a new english uh libretto by grant pricer at um orlando yeah. opera Okay. Um, then, uh, that will be in Italian. And then we're in, to start the year, uh, we're going to be back at the Ebo club next door, which is kind of our home base, uh, for I think six performances of, uh, Scuola de Gelosi by Salieri. That is a U.S. premiere. Never been done in the U.S. It's a, a lot like Cozy. Hmm. Um, and this is, we picked that time slot and, uh, the venue, and the the piece kind of all based on the success of um, Ercole that we had two seasons ago um, in the Ebel where we built a whole proscenium and um, very to the period kind of production that was just a huge success here. 
Uh, so we're going to go back to that. And this will be um, traditional, but with twist. You know, I, I keep seeing things like Bridgerton or Marie Antoinette sure. movie uh, in my mind. So, uh, but, you know, Salieri, very, sounds like Mozart. Uh, it's good music. It's a comedy. Uh, I should mention the other one was a comedy as well. Um, okay. So two, two very obscure um operas in the middle three la premieres uh and one u.s premiere then um in the spring we'll have propaganda our annual gala but then uh, we're going to end the season with um hms pinafore oh that'd be uh, fun. that's been a you know gilbert and sullivan i love the mikado uh, we've done twice and we've had a huge production of pirates of penzance um last season that just killed and we're going to do that this one at heritage square which is a um, historic museum with where they've taken a bunch of Victorian houses from all over LA and made like a little town, basically. So we'll do it right in the middle of that perfect setting for Victorian opera. And uh, that'll be with picnicking and table seating also. Um, so, and that's a co-production with Opera Las Vegas. So we'll open in Vegas and then come here. Uh, and that's the first, that's June of 25 second two weekends of 25 so you know heavy on comedy and and then rosalka but uh and uh two outdoor productions one new venue uh it's it's very eclectic you know it's it's a it's a risk in that you know so many companies right now are are going to the standbys because things are tough and getting tougher at the moment um with audience and finances so we see a lot of carmens and bohems and and barbers and all that but uh, we actually think we have this niche of like either the updated productions or like these things you're you're only going to get to see one time ever you know yeah. so um we're i'm i'm very excited about that they're all new productions for me i've never directed any of those so all right that's cool. you quite the challenge you set up for yourself but it sounds really exciting <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah we'll see how much i'm regarding that um, <laughs> well we'll 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 oh, revisit. Yeah. We'll we'll revisit with you uh, in March 2025 and see how it goes. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I know I know that's something that that everyone is always curious about, uh, and I've asked I think everyone who's come on the podcast this question. But when someone comes in and auditions for you, uh, and I imagine you've seen more auditions than you can count at this point, right? Uh, What's something that a singer could do to make their audition stand out from the other thousand you're hearing that year? Okay. So it starts a month before you audition for me because you need to research. I mean, the internet is such a powerful tool. You, you can know, you can find out, you can watch this podcast. You can find out exactly who I am and what I, what I'm into. It's not hard to see. I like comedy. I like uh, to be entertained and um you know of course you also have to be a, a excellent singer and and do all the other things but i think the people who have the most success just cold auditioning for me um are the ones who have done you know they made the calls to their friends who have worked here and been like what is he like like what should i sing um and they'll be like oh he loves the mikado or he loves this like and um and you know call that cheating or whatever it, it's not it's just research um so that then your first 10 seconds have to be some of your best like because to be on completely honest when we've seen a hundred auditions already in the, the two days before i'm almost looking for a reason to, to tune out so like mm. if you come in and your first note is a risk and it doesn't pay off. It's real hard to get us back into that. So I always caution people to start with something that you feel you can sing almost any day. And like, there's no question of like, Oh, am I going to like not quite get there in the first 20 seconds? Um, and then you can win me over from there. But if you lose me instantly, you know, there's exceptions to all these things. Of course, you could go in that day and sing that better than you ever have, and I'm enraptured the whole time. But uh, and then there's just the the um, you know, I just want to work with people that seem fun. You know, so 
whatever you can do to put your head in that space of being comfortable and an actual person and not a machine. Um, I, that, that goes a long way with me. So step one, do your research. Step two is don't be boring. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and step three is make sure you're having fun too. Yeah. 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 Perfect. I love it. I love it. Well, uh, Josh, we are pushing right up against time on this one. Uh, I have learned so much in, in hanging out with you for a little while. I'm so excited to hear about what's coming for pop, even in, in the next couple of weeks with butterfly. Uh, and, and the, you know, we got to talk about the, the next season as well. Uh, you clearly have a, such a unique perspective on opera and on, on updating it because I, I hope we'd agree that some people do not such a great job of updating opera and some people do a fantastic job of, up, of updating opera. Um, as far as I've seen, the productions coming out of pop are firmly on the fantastic side of updating opera. Um, so I, I wish you nothing but the best. I always want to give my guests the, the final word. Is there any sort of last bit of, of advice or wisdom or knowledge that you would like to pass on to any singer, potential uh, audience member, potential director, uh, or current director who, who might be listening? Um, yeah, for the singers and the directors, just be the most prepared. That's all you can do. That's one thing you can control. You can't control, you know, the way you feel that day or the talent that you have to some extent even, but you can be the most prepared you can possibly be. And then for audience members, just go, just go, just go to something like we need you. You're going to, I, how many times have I gone to something where I was like, that was a complete waste of time. Almost never, almost never. So uh, just go, just come see us. All right. You heard him people come see, come see pop, go see Josh uh, over in Highland park or, or wherever pop ends up doing, <laughs> doing their next show. Uh, again, Josh, thank you so much for your time. I deeply, deeply appreciate it. Uh, and I wish you nothing but the best. Thanks dude. Pleasure. I hope you enjoyed listening to that conversation as much as I enjoyed having it. If you like this type of content, please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. That way you'll get first dibs on everything new that we're coming out with to give yourself the edge in the audition room.